Yeah, thank you, um, Richard, for for joining us. Um, we are we're really excited to hear more about your presentation. Um, yeah, please take it away. Thank you, Mari, for your uh, kind introduction. Um, as mentioned, I grew up in in Winnipeg, went to high school there, and my undergraduate and was interested in earthquake engineering, Manitoba being uh, not a very interesting place to study earthquakes and uh, uh, went to California. Um, my family actually moved to Vancouver. And so I haven't seen them in probably about, well, with all the things going on about two years. So maybe someone can knock on my mom's door and say hi to me for me. Uh, but anyways, um, I'm excited to present this work to you. This is something that I've been working on over a, a period of a, a few years, I have a fairly high teaching load. And so I, I tried to, to make some concentrated efforts uh, in research. And this is something that really was spurred on and started as a result of my work at the California Division of Safety of Dams. So related to that, and, and so at the California Division of Safety of Dams is a regulatory agency um, in California, for instance, there's 13, over 1,300 dams in, in the state. Um, and uh, because of that, and because of the high seismicity of the area, is that we're needing to constantly evaluate the stability of dams. Uh, and in doing that, one of the challenges in predicting the seismic deformations, potential seismic deformations in a dam in the future, is what type of seismic loading are we going to design for in particular on the the left hand side you would see uh, various uh, probabilistic seismic hazard analysis targets uh, on the right hand side would be a deterministic approach that's often used still in california as well but one of the key decisions in this is well what ground motion intensity measure should this be developed for first first is the level is it 50th, 84th percentile? Is it a return period of 2475? Is it 5,000 years, 10,000 years? Uh, and then also what intensity measure are we needing is, is of importance? Spectral acceleration, peak ground velocity, cumulative absolute velocity as an example. There were general recommendations uh, by the state agency, but still, I think there was still some uncertainty and, um, maybe lack of confidence um, at that particular time in the past, if in fact that was the best measure, prim primarily because you know, the consultants would be presenting their work and you know, consultant A would think this would be the best ground motion intensity measure and consultant B would think another one was and so forth. Uh, another application of this work is highlighted right here. Um, so this is, um, data, and I'll, I'll describe this data in, in a minute, from the magnitude six Napa earthquake that occurred in 2014. The black dots that you see, or actually all the dots, are different dams that are located uh, in the Bay Area. And the star is the epicenter of the earthquake. Uh, with, with having, well, a, a lot of dams in California, uh, one of the important aspects is following a significant event, these dams need to be inspected. And which dams need to be inspected first? Um, to accomplish this task is the California Division of Safety of Dams. And I should also note other, um, other water uh, service um, units such as East Bay Mud and Valley Water, for instance, use systems such as Shakecast. Um, Shakecast runs on Shake Maps. Shake Maps is a, uh, is a, pro, uh, is a service provided from the um, USGS as an example. And so based on this, you'll see uh, a series of dots, uh, the orange dots and then the yellow dots. The intent with this is a prioritization. And actually there's a red dot right here is a prioritization on which dam should be inspected first. And so they have um, some simple metrics uh, to do that uh, as well. Oops. So 
with with these motivations, um, I'm going to be presenting the work from two uh, projects. Um, the the first is uh, a paper um, that I presented at a USDSD conference. If someone is interested in this paper, you're welcome to to contact me. My contact information is later uh, in the in this presentation, and then a subsequent uh paper as well as the work related to that that has been uh, published in earthquake spectra and all of this relates to i guess you could think of it efficiency of ground motion intensity measures with earthquake induced deformations or another way of saying it is for earth dams um, embankment dams even potentially tailings what characteristics of earthquake shaking best relate to deformations. So first I'm going to talk about over the next uh, several slides uh, talking about ground motion intensity measures and uh, dam damage. Here's the paper and I'm certainly happy to provide you a copy of it if you are interested in that. So the purpose of this particular study and, and this dam and this event will come up uh, later on is to explore uh, the capabilities of strong ground motion recordings to track deformations. Uh, in particular, uh, what we see here um, is on the left-hand side are a series of strong ground motion instruments at uh, Linehan Dam. Uh, Linehan Dam, you can see the, the location provided uh, right here. And uh, it is, uh, located in kind of South Bay area, um, and it was shaken strongly uh, during the 1989 Milo earthquake. There were recordings all along the abutment and at the at and at the crest, and as I will show, there were also some notable deformations uh, in particular in the lateral direction this would be downstream the displacements i apologize for the english units my apologies uh 0.1 to 0.25 feet and in terms of the vertical direction uh 0.61 to 0.85 feet and in terms of pga as an example uh the abutment recorded a PGA of 0.44 G, and the crest was between 0.38 and 0.45 G. So what this provides is a useful case to see if or it, what information can be provided from these strong ground, ground motion instruments that may relate to, in this case, the, the deformations. And this these deformations actually did relate to some damage, in particular cracking in the embankment. So what I'm gonna go through first is go through the uh, strong ground motion results and highlighting if or anything is indicated in these results and how it relates to deformations. First up, what we're going to, what you see here is the acceleration, velocity, and displacement. This is measured, the abutment, the lateral crest, and the right crest. And so also what I've provided here is a dot and that dot is the time and the magnitude associated with the, the maximum absolute value. Uh, these are all measured. Also in terms of displacement and velocity, this has been obtained by integrating and then double integrating the acceleration time history. What also will be important uh, in this particular evaluation that I'm going to show you is to because we have, this is highlighted right here, no permanent deformation that you can, well, get from double integrating the acceleration time history, although I have included the permanent deformation in the lateral direction. It was useful in this particular study to extend these results uh, by including numerical simulations of Linehan Dam during the same event. I'm gonna talk about the numerical simulations for Linehan Dam in greater detail later on in this presentation. But what I am gonna show you next is the calculated results. And 
if I go back and forth, uh, there certainly are some differences. Um, but from a maybe practical standpoint, uh, they are somewhat close uh, to what's being measured. The, the reason I say that is, is not at this stage to evaluate uh, the numerical model itself, but to say, well, maybe we can extend some of our observations measured by looking at the calculated. In particular, is the fact that in these simulations, and this is all at the crest, you can see that as the simulations are suggesting is that you have some permanent deformations and that's gonna be helpful later on as we look at the timing of, for instance, when the timing of key metrics are located and how that relates to deformations. In particular, or for example, you can see that the maximum displacement was calculated at about 10 seconds, whereas the maximum peak ground acceleration um, at the crest was several seconds before that particular time. The goal here is if or anything, can you relate maybe triggering of some condition with the strong ground motion instrument with deformations, which would be important in terms of determining whether or not there's an expectation, especially if you had this data remotely, to go and inspect that particular facility. In particular, what you see here now is the red curves in both cases are the calculated accumulation of displacement relative to the base of the numerical analysis. The hope in this is that this is, and you can see this at least in the case in vertical direction, is that this red line is the calculated variation in displacement over time. And you can see that it's within the range that was observed. Laterally, you could see that the displacement was over predicted. But hopefully the timing at least is, would have been similar had we been able to measure this um, during the earthquake in comparison to what we're calculating. And as I had alluded to in the previous, um, the previous slide, is that, and maybe not surprisingly, uh, is that in terms of the maximum displacement certainly does not occur uh, with the time of maximum peak ground velocity and air acceleration. But you do see, for instance, that when you start accumulating those values is that it does correspond, at least in this particular case, reasonably well to the location of the maximum values at the abutment. I should note that the, the abutment PGA and the abutment PGV, that is in fact the same point, just the square is laid over top of the circle. So in terms of peak-based characteristics, focus being trying to look at which characteristics of earthquake shaking relate to deformations is that it doesn't seem in terms of maybe when deformations occur, maybe roughly speaking, abutment PGA seems like at least describes a little bit uh, in terms of when they start, but not particularly helpful or nothing really jumps out in any other respect. Another tool and something that we frequently think about is the impacts of changes in frequently content or how that might relate to deformations. What I have provided here on the top row are the variations in uh, displacements calculated. And then subsequently, these plots below is a short-term Fourier spect uh, spectrum these small windows over time at different locations. Uh, this is the right and left crest, the two, two strong ground motion instruments, and then also the abutment. These colors, the brightest colors are representing to the, 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 the heart largest amplitude at that particular frequency. So in this case, this is zero, five, and 10. And so what we are seeing and what we should expect is as when we have strong shaking and when we're accumulating deformations, well, that means is that we have a reduction in stiffness. We have a reduction in stiffness, then our frequency is going to go down. And if our frequency goes down, then our period is going to go up. And so this is indicating that 
um, due to softening of the embankment, that there is in fact a change in the period of the embankment over time. It's certainly interesting um, and it makes for uh, a colorful plot, um, but from a practical standpoint, in terms of maybe using this in a simplistic way to predict deformations remotely following earthquake, this may be a difficult approach to implement. Next up, I'm going to talk about two cumulative based characteristics and two intensity measures, which I will be talking about more uh, in this presentation. First is ARIES intensity. ARIES intensity, if you're unfamiliar with it, is if you have the time history, acceleration time history, you square the acceleration time history, uh, and then you would integrate it. And if you integrate it for all time, then multiply it by two and then divide it by 2G, this would be your total ARIES intensity. Or alternatively, you could view it as it accumulates over time. What I've done here is to try to to try to compare how the accumulation of an ARIES intensity, because you're slowly you know, adding the contributions of this integral as it gets larger and, and larger, you know, adding up areas. Um, what I've done is to kind of normalize all of these things and to see, in particular, does ARIES intensity track the accumulation of displacements um, that were calculated for this numerical analysis? And so what we have here is that the red line, if you look in both of these, the red line in both cases is the calculated crest displacement, but normalized. So it so that would be normalized by the maximum value. You can see that right here. DYR is the displacement relative to the base divided by the final displacement. So that would be, and so that's the red. And then the black, the blue, and the green are a ratio of various intensity. Little AI being the one that varies with respect to time, the big AI being the final ARIES intensity. And I don't know, somewhat shockingly, at least when I first plotted this uh, a, a while ago, is that the, and this is again for only one event and one dam, but in, in fact, if you do look at the crest settlement and the abutment, and also please note that the, the settlement, well, as in, implied by settlement, it was a, a vertical uh, deformation. Um, and so, but in fact, is that the ARIES intensity, and another important distinction is the red is, this is the calculated crest displacement. The black is the measured acceleration at the abutment then the acceleration, the, then the area's intensity calculated for that measured acceleration. So this is measured, this is calculated. But what we are seeing is that the, it tracks quite well the expected variation in displacement. The abutment does a better job of the lateral, of, of the, uh, it does a better job than the accelerations at the, that were measured on the right and left crest. So this is in terms of vertical deformations. Over on the side to the left, I mean, certainly because there's the embankment's moving back and forth, there is definitely more variation in terms of the displacement, which is not being uh, which is not being tracked with the area's intensity. But um, it does seem like it does a pretty decent job of tracking deformation over time. These cumulative based characteristics or ARIES intensities are also sometimes called, you know, evolutionary and they evolve over time. But so this is one. Another, which I'm going to show you on the next slide, is cumulative absolute velocity. The main difference between the calculation of this intensity measure, ARIES intensity, and cumulative absolute velocities. And here you see there's a square, whereas with cumulative absolute velocity, as the A suggests, it's absolute, is that you can see that there's an absolute velocity, uh, or it takes the absolute value of those particular parameters and then adds it up. 
you see that the big impact here is between the square and the absolute value is that in both cases, I go back and forth, the red line's not changing. What's changing here are the black, blue, and green. Same acceleration time history, that was measured. The difference being is that here I'm tracking cumulative absolute velocity, here I'm clocking, tra tracking area's intensity, is that we are seeing is because of the fact of the, the different way in which cumulative absolute velocity is defined, it does not track the variation displacement quite so well. So this is indicating um, that in terms of the intensity measures, in terms of the characteristics that we can directly calculate from acceleration uh, from these strong ground motion instruments, which is providing acceleration, uh, is that in terms of uh, peak measures, so PGA, PGV, and um, well, I guess and uh, PGA and PGV, I get would be the good ones. In terms of some type of frequency content, uh, and then cumulative measures such as area's intensity and cumulative absolute velocity, is that of those area's intensity related best to the accumulation of deformations, and with that, cumulative-based ground motion characteristics appear to be the preferred choice for remote prediction of deformations of an earth dam immediately following an earthquake. Now, one thing that this that I've shown thus far, and which I'm going to focus more on, is what this is interesting in that maybe it can track the, the accumulation of displacement. But I think in most cases, we just want to know remotely, there's an earthquake, we have a dam, that is uh, maybe 50, 50 kilometers from where we need to inspect it. Is there any way that we could predict? I don't really as much interested in how it accumulates, but what's the what what might be the the vertical def deformation? What what might be the damage at that dam? So really, we're interested more in terms of the magnitude and predicting that magnitude, and so that's going to relate to a subsequent work that I'm going to be showing you next. But this is suggestive that there is something powerful about these cumulative base characteristics. So that relates to the next paper, um, and I'm going to be highlighting that in the, the remainder of this presentation. So this relates best to the first slide, uh, which had to do with developing um, a seismic hazard um, often, you know, we're using a uh, you know, uniform hazard spectrum as an example, um, but uh, certainly there are options to be able to define the seismic hazard for other targets. In terms of picking whether or not it was pseudospectral acceleration, such as in the case of the uniform hazard spectrum, or another intensity measure, in terms of this setting, such as peak uh, peak ground acceleration, areas intensity, significant dur uh, duration, and so forth, is there's a few important characteristics which are important in terms of these particular decisions. These are split up into the following three. The first is what's referred to as predictability. Um, this is the way that this can be quantified is a predictable intensity measure is one in which the standard deviation of the prediction of that intensity measure, so let's say peak ground acceleration, is low. Um, and so that's a, a, so if something is predictable, you know, if ground motion measure A is more predictable than ground motion measure uh, B, then that means that ground motion A has a lower standard deviation in that particular case. The other, and this is the focus of this present study, is efficiency. Efficiency now focuses on a particular structure. In this case, my focus is on earth dams. And in particular, what, what the goal here is to determine the standard deviation, standard deviation of the prediction of some engineering demand parameter. So for instance, vertical deformation of a dam um, with respect to the ground motion measure itself, or conditioned on the ground motion measure itself, and I'll describe that later on.
The last, which is also important, is the sufficiency of a uh, ground motion intensity measure. And that refers to the bias of those results with respect to things such as earthquake magnitude, earthquake distance, and epsilon. Pictorially, you can see that the, the pictorially, you can explore this idea of efficiency provided right here. Uh, in particular, you know what what you would want uh, is, and this is highlighted in, in three different cases, is that your expectation is that for your structure, and let's say for instance, displacement delta is the key metric that in terms of the performance of your facility that you're interested in. And with that, um, you your expectation would be one is that as the percentile level or as the, the strength of that particular ground motion characteristics increases, for instance, PGA, in a deterministic sense from 50th to 67th to 84th, the expectation first is that, well, you know, you'd expect that that performance metric, say displacement, will increase. Which is the first problem with the one provided on the far left is that this this particular situation would not help you at all because now you'd say well if i have a 50th percentile loading or 84th i'm getting the same type of deformations and that's certainly possible if you pick the wrong characteristic of earthquake shaking well just like as an example imagine if it was the um i don't know the day of the month for instance which, which would be a silly one but hopefully you get the idea is that it, if, if that was a characteristic of the earthquake, that probably would have no relation. So that's important. But then also important is that we would desire to have at, say, a particular loading level, for example, 67, is that this red solid line would be the mean prediction, and then the dotted line above and below would be plus or minus one standard deviation. Is the hope is that you would want to pick one where at that particular level is that you have an efficient prediction meaning that you know you're not going to expect to be significantly uh, above or below and so in these ca three cases is that the most efficient ground motion intensity measure of im1 2 and 3 is going to be the one highlighted on this far side so this was my objective and i wanted to do this um, for a, a situation that was going to applicable to the dams in California. And so the approach was as follows. I wanted to find two different dams for which I had a case history of deformations of that dam. In particular, because I was going to extend this study with a series of numerical analyses, I wanted to have a case history for which I had a recording of acceleration on the abutment and on the crest to be able to evaluate whether or not my numerical model was working adequately. And then subsequently, I was going to conduct many, many, many more analyses with different ground motions. And with that, be able to compare what the impact of different intensity measures was in terms of displacements as an example. And with that, then to be able to calculate the efficiency, which is going to be the standard deviation. Then by determining the intensity measure, I could then do that for different types of intensity measures. So I've listed a few already, um, PGA, PGV, intensity, and so forth, and then determine, well, which is going to be most efficient. So the case history I chose was the 1989 Loma Prieta earthquake, and the two dams for this study was Linehan Dam. I've described Linehan Dam already. You can see Linehan Dam provided right here. And then Anderson Dam, uh, which is uh, near, so San Jose is about right, right up here. So it's, it's down here. Both are in a high seismic region. One of the important aspects with these two dams is that they're different. Um, there's definitely a difference in height, but the key differences that were particularly of importance to me was that Anderson Dam, this lower finer fill and the alluvium that you see in recent um, 
in recent seismic um, evaluations of this particular facility have been identified as potentially liquefiable. That was not the case for Linehan Dam. And so now we had two embankments that in the one above, no liquefaction in the one above, the potential for liquefaction. And so this also provided two different scenarios to, to test the impact of different ground motion intensity measures on deformations. So a key aspect of this work was going to be extending the case histories with a quote, calibrated numerical model for different types of situations. The software program that I utilized to accomplish this was uh, FLAC, um, FLAC 2D. And so what I'm highlighting here is the numerical model for Linehan Dam. And below that is Anderson Dam. Also, the constitutive models that I utilized for the embankment material uh, for both was UBC HIST, but for the lower finer fill upstream alluvium and downstream alluvium for the for uh, Anderson Dam, this would be the one below, I used the PM4 sand model. This is an effective stress model that captures and calculates the impacts of excess pore pressure on the degradation of stiffness, accumulation of shear strain, and so forth. What I want to do now, I'm not going to get into all the specifics, but I did want to highlight maybe some of the important aspects uh, or maybe interesting aspects of this particular analysis. Uh, in particular, um, first up is that UBC HIST, um, the UBC, University of British Columbia, um, was developed as a useful extension to the more Coulomb model that was able to better capture the, degrade, the, the degradation in stiffness and damping ratio. And you can see that here. So for example, the target damping curve that I've provided on this particular slide is Vasodic and Dobry 91 for a PI of equal to 30. And so you can see that the UBC HIST model is capable of capturing well that particular situation. This simulation is for a single element test, in fact, a, a drain direct simple shear test simulation, which is a useful tool to be able to test the capabilities of a constitutive model. Another critical aspect was both the calibration, well, and this is the case for all of the constitutive models, the calibration as well as just identifying well what what is a what is the PM4 sand model able to capture? So on the left hand side, you have the stress strain response. It looks very typical to what you would expect in an undrained. This is an undrained uh, cyclic simple shear type of simulation um, with a selection of these parameters. And these parameters, relative density, and G naught were estimated based on the N160 clean sand value, a parameter that could be determined uh, for Anderson Dam and the material that was tested, for instance, the lower finer fill. And the way that the HP naught parameter was selected was to achieve a particular target cyclic resistance, or that would be the CSR at 15 cycles. And you can see that based on this type of evaluation is that a numerical model like this for these uh, five simulations was able to reasonably capture well the variation in CSR with number of cycles. And this is the number of cycles to 3% shear strain. This is an example with an N160 clean sand of 15. A few other key aspects in this particular analysis. Uh, one, and this is actually um, a, a, a blessing um, in terms of when this earthquake occurred. Um, I remember I was in Winnipeg in my, in my basement with my dad watching uh, the World Series game, the beginning of it, and uh, it occurred in October. Uh, October, uh, that's, well, typically, uh, well, quite dry. Uh, and so there had been several 
several years of drought. And so when the earthquake occurred, it was much below the maximum normal water uh, surface elevation. And so also one of the challenges in terms of evaluating the uh, ability of the model to capture the deformations during the 1989 Loma Prater earthquake was being able to capture this condition at this particular location here. The challenge with that is that this is a non-steady state type of situation where you know the reservoir drops and it's going to take some time for the embankment to uh, the, the water in the embankment to, to lower as well. In addition to that, permeability is a hard parameter to estimate in this particular situation. And so the, the general kind of stage of this type of analysis was that the permeability was adjusted within reasonable region, uh, re ways to accomplish, to reasonably capture the variation in um, poor water pressures that were measured. I'll show you a plot of that in a moment. So those permeabilities were adjusted, steady state seepage analyses were conducted in FLAC. And then a transient seepage analysis was done in FLAC where the boundary conditions were adjusted so that it was at this particular depth. And then, then the analysis was conducted for a certain amount of time until it reasonably matched the piezometer readings. This is highlighted on the page here. And so what you're seeing here is these are the, the blue dots are the values of total head um, that were measured uh, during the 1989 Loma Prieta earthquake? I would, I'm, I'm, my assumption here it was it was just before the earthquake. I think that's what I had. That would be the logical thing to do is just before the earthquake because these the seepage analysis. The intent was it was the intent for this was it for was it to to capture the effective stresses prior to shaking and then shaking would be a subsequent analysis and so the goal with this was, was to reasonably capture the changes in effective stress because that would then affect the strengths that were going to be input in the subsequent analysis and so with this the analysis was conducted um, you know with these small values measured values as highlighted here uh, it's it's hard to really have a lot of confidence uh, at, from a from a practical standpoint. You know, you're around a foot. Um, there's there's a lot of different um, material. There's a lot of different ways in which you could calibrate your constitutive models. Different changes you could make and still get a foot. Um, but if nothing else, I think it would have been alarming in the numerical analysis if, if I had been getting 10 feet as an example. And, you know, in fact, we had measured during the earthquake uh, less than a foot. But it was in the same order of magnitude. Uh, also important, and this is why the dam dams were picked as they were, and that's because strong ground motion recordings were available is what was also provided here are this is a summary of a comparison in terms of the um, this is pseudospectral acceleration the ratio of the pseudospectral acceleration this is at the crest and the abutment then different types of intensity measures red is calculated uh, black is measured and so one of the key aspects will is in terms of the the predominant period of shaking. And so in this case, you know, if I take the, the ratio of the two, you see that the period seemed to, there's this one increase right around here, around 0 0.7, 0 0.8 as an example. There's also some increases here. It's certainly not the easiest um, parameter to be able to determine that being the period of an embankment such as this that is yielding. Um, during shaking. And then we have Anderson Dam is here, which you can see that, so calculated and measured, I believe this was at the crest. So there is some commonality, but some differences uh, as as well. And And so with this, one could certainly not say it's perfectly calibrated. That's certainly hard to do. 
in an actual practical situation. Um, it's certainly useful to do centrifuge testing and, and that is a, a very effective way of testing the capabilities of numerical model in a much more controlled environment. Uh, but you know we're doing a, a two-dimensional analysis. Uh, there's a lot of aspects that could be lost, but generally speaking, I felt comfortable with the overall capabilities of the model to explore, well, what are the impacts of other earthquakes in terms of the relationship between deformations and earthquake shaking? And so that's the next part. This was accomplished by selecting uh, a total of 342 single component ground motions and running a series of flak analyses with that. These ground motions um, were selected with, uh, with, um, with characteristics uh, in terms of distance, magnitude, and so, so forth that were consistent with a typical situation of a dam in California. It would be fairly high magnitudes, uh, short distances. Uh, and then what I'm highlighting here is to show the variability in some of the important intensity measures, in particular PGA, PGV, ARIES intensity, cumulative absolute velocity, and significant duration. That D595, that is the, the time between 5 and 95% of the ARIES intensity. The, those histograms are highlighting the variation in those particular parameters, and the blue uh, and red dot is highlighting what the magnitudes were during the actual 1989 Lomba Prieta earthquake. The importance of this is that you can see that with the ground motions that we're utilizing is that they are going to be both below as well as, at least in the case of Linehan Dam below, and but significantly above that of the Loma Prieta earthquake. And so the expectation is with the, with the Loma Prieta earthquake, the dams um, deformed less than a foot is that the expectation is that there should be larger deformations and that certainly was the case. What I'm going to be showing is selected results uh, for three of the, the over 300 ground motions uh, to just compare deformations. In particular, the metric that I'm using is the shear strain increment um, which is a measure of uh, shear strain. And on the left-hand side is Linehan Dam, the right-hand side is Anderson Dam. And what I'm gonna show as I go to ground motion B and C is that ground motion A was fairly low shaking, ground motion B was moderate, and ground motion C was larger. On the model for Anderson, the Anderson Dam model, what we are going to see is the impact of high excess pore pressures in the lower finer fill and the alluvium and as a result much larger deformation so there's ground motion a ground motion b larger in both cases the scale is not changing and then finally ground motion c over the next few plots i'm going to be contrasting Displacement is going to be on the vertical axis. The horizontal axis is going to be different ground motion intensity measures. And the goal in this is to look at the relationship between the two, and in particular, to be able to evaluate the efficiency, the efficiency being shown next. So the horizontal axis, and this is for Linehan Dam, is this is the various intensity measures. You can read them right there. And these are of the calculated so i have the calculated acceleration at the base of my numerical analysis and that based on each of those 342 ground motions i then compute each of the, the measures here for each of those ground motions there's going to be some vertical displacement positive being down and horizontal displacement positive being downstream and that and that was i think in fact the case i think you know actually it was absolute value in this case what i've highlighted here also is ground motion a b and c so you can see that and then oh also is that 
I'm using the, these are log X and log Y. And so for each of these is a linear regression analysis between the log, the natural log of each of these intensity measures and the natural log of displacement. Here's the prediction. And then one of the things that I was looking at plus or minus one standard deviation. Just by looking at this, the most efficient intensity measure is that for which has the lowest standard deviation. That would be the standard deviation of displacement or the engineering demand parameter conditioned on one of these. And in this case, you can see the ones that seem to come out would be areas intensity and cumulative absolute velocity. There's some maybe indication why this might be based on the work that I showed you previously for Linehan Dam during the 1989 Loma Prieta earthquake. But this is for Linehan Dam, which did not liquefy. Here's Anderson Dam. Anderson Dam did liquefy. Now, one of the complexities is that in terms of lateral displacement, as I will highlight right here, is that there was a lot of movement downwards, but laterally it moved a little bit to the right and to the left. And in some cases, there were a lot of inconsistency in, in terms of what the lateral deformation was in that particular case. Not the case for vertical in terms of settlement, but in some cases, you know, it moves this way and it moves this way, but in the end, maybe it ends up being near zero. And so there was, that was a hard value of deformation to predict. And you can see that by the increased standard deviation in comparison to vertical displacement. But what we do see is if you look through, especially vertical displacement, which is arguably the more important of the two for at least um, overtopping, once again, areas intensity and cumulative absolute velocity seem to jump out. And this is for the base intensity measures. Lots of results, but now we could then con contract compute I've just done this pictorially, but now in terms of the standard deviations themselves, and I am underlying those values that are the lowest, so that would be the most efficient. So this is by looking at the acceleration calculate the base of the model. The Linehan Dam, you can see that area intensity in both cases were. Anderson Dam, it's a bit of a muddier picture here for horizontal displacement, but it does interesting relate to pseudo spectral acceleration that will be discussed in a moment but you do see that once again it is the case for vertical displacement for anderson dam one could also look at the crest um, so for instance what i'm saying here is you calculate the acceleration at the crest and you can't compare that to the displacement at the crest Aries intensity and in fact peak ground velocity pops up but i should please do note that if you contrast the two is that the standard deviation is lower. You provide a more efficient prediction of displacement based on the ground motion at the base, which would be equivalent to the abutment, than at the crest. This is then doing a regression where the intensity measure of interest is the ratio of those two parameters as well. The last one that I'm gonna show, and then I'm gonna be wrapping up in just a few moments, is, and I alluded to this a little bit in terms of the pseudospectral acceleration at 0.3, one and three seconds, is as we do for buildings, um, is that we're gonna def define, for instance, a uniform hazard spectrum because it relates to, well, the, the performance of a particular building. But interesting enough, what we're seeing is something slightly different for these two embankments. In terms of how the characteristics of shaking as described by pseudospectral acceleration and as it relates to performance, what we're seeing in fact is that in terms of efficiency as defined as the standard deviation of the natural log of the engineering demand parameter conditioned on the natural log of the intensity measure is that 
certainly there is some tracking of pseudospectral acceleration and not surprisingly most likely i suspect that the important the period of the embankment probably where these this local this minimum is in both cases because that would probably relate best to deformations but regardless of pseudospectral acceleration and what pseudospectral acceleration you use is that Aries intensity is consistently a more efficient predictor of deformations than spectral acceleration and in fact in some cases you know for some periods cumulative absolute velocity is as well as a reminder the reason potentially one reason of this greater uh, greater efficiency of Aries intensity was highlighted for Linehan dam and that being the square the square root, the square rather, what that means is that you have a faster accumulation with respect to time than you do with the absolute value. And so in the case of what I've shown thus far, you're certainly seeing that come out in terms of the efficiency. But there is a problem with the square and that has to do with predictability. And one of the things that I'm gonna show you next and predictability being you're going to divide, develop a seismic hazard uh you, or you're going to develop a seismic hazard assessment and you're going to do that for aries intensity and cumulative absolute velocity what we will know here in just a moment is that the predictability is a bit different in particular predictability is this particular term right here this is what you would be predicting from a ground motion prediction equation um, and the importance of this is that the total uncertainty, so if we wanted to determine the uncertainty in an engineering de demand parameter based on magnitude, distance, and other parameters, is equal to the square root of the standard deviation squared plus b, where b squared is from the regression analysis times the predictability. For some scenario, so here's an example of one. Here is the predictability. No, that's not. Oh, okay, so mistake. This is the wrong plot. This is not the predictability because it's the same plot. My apologies on that. So I had made a little boo-boo here. But what you would have seen had I shown this uh, correctly, and maybe I'll, I'll get, I'll, I can find the plot. Um, but what you would have found uh, is that once you include, let me go back here, I'll just focus on this slide, is that the predictability of cumulative absolute velocity is much less than Aries intensity. And so as a result, when you add, this term was small for Aries intensity, but predictability was large for Aries intensity. This term was small, was larger for cumulative absolute velocity, but smaller for cumulative absolute velocity is in terms of total uncertainty, and I actually included in this particular paper, um, is that the total uncertainty is actually lower for cumulative absolute velocity, because I need to update those particular, those are the wrong plots. So in summary, for this ground motion study, a few things. One is that the ground motion study was conducted with a large suite of ground motions that were consistent of the seismic environment in California. I did effectively show you this, but uh, the Aries intensity was the most uh, efficient intensity measure. Uh, maybe if I, if I am able to include these plots for you all, I'll update those two plot, plots. But however, predictability of Aries intensity is poorer than than uh than the other intensity measures and that a lot of that comes from the square in its calculation and it does relate in a higher total uncertainty for for the earthquake scenario that i did consider um and based on that metric and i and I, maybe i can show it in, a, in in an updated set of slides is that cumulative absolute velocity was deemed in that situation and i provided that paper to have the lowest total standard deviation what are the implications? So the implications being um, is that Aries intensity or cumulative absolute velocity 
is that it certainly seems from this and from what I showed previously is that these cumulative measures, these evolutionary measures seem to relate very well to the deformations of an earth structure, such as an embankment. And so they should definitely be included in a seismic hazard assessment, in addition to, you know, those traditional ones, such as spectral acceleration. And if after an earthquake, and I talked about this, is that area's intensity may be an optimal intensity measure. So in terms of acknowledgments, um, this project was uh, funded from the California Geological Strong Emotion Instrumentation Program. Also, the Santa Clara Valley Water District, who is the owner of those two particular dams, was particularly helpful in obtaining some additional data for discussions. Also, the California Division of Safety Dams was certainly helpful for various conversations along the way. And also at Sacramento State, an RCA award also helped uh, in doing some of this particular work. Thank you everybody for your time. And I certainly would uh, welcome some questions if there, if you have any. Thanks, Richie. Um, yeah, so if anyone wants to ask any questions, feel free to put them in the chat box. I know just one has already sort of popped in, so maybe I'll start with that. Um, so, Earthfield dams are sometimes located in valleys or of regular shapes. When we develop time histories for flak analyses, for example, we usually carry out linear scaling and or spectral matching, but design uh, seismic hazard parameters such as the response spectra um, are typically developed for level ground conditions. How accurate, in your opinion, is using a matched input ground motion developed for level ground conditions at the dam foundation um, for stress deformation analyses. There's one other part, but maybe I'll, I'll stop there. Uh, yeah, so in, in terms of accuracy, you know, certainly it brings in a lot of added complexities. Um, I guess at, at a minimum, um, you will be able to appreciate the level of seismic loading um, regardless of whether or not it's a valley or not. Uh, and so I guess what I'm, I'm trying to allude to is that the, the valley is going to uh, affect the accuracy as, as that particular person has highlighted. Um, but at least I would expect that if that that environment is close to uh, a, a series of faults, um, that at, at least you would be able to appreciate and account for that the seismic loading is high or that the seismic loading is low. In terms of the accuracy, um, and so maybe for instance, if you were to predict seismic shaking but then you also of a of a previous event, and then you were to compare it. Uh, I suspect it, it could be it could be um, fairly off, at least in terms of the maybe if you were to to compare, you know, like a fast four A transform or something like that potentially. But my hope, at least, is in terms of the deformations, is that you know as long as the loading level is I'm sorry um, is is fairly close. Um, is that you You should hopefully be in terms of the ballpark uh, in terms of deformations. Right. And sort of a follow-up on that question, what specific suggestions, if any, do you have for developing input ground motions uh, for stress deformation analyses? Yeah, it, it's, um, so I, I think it, it, it becomes uh, really challenging or dicey when you have a, a very kind of notched canyon, um, and especially if you're doing a, a two-dimensional analysis, um, I would I would probably consider in that particular case trying to develop the ground motion at depth for a fairly consistent type of situation. 
And then in your numerical analysis, especially if you're able to do a three-dimensional analysis, is then to include the complexity such as the 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 the, the walls of the the valley and so forth in your overall analysis. That's a tough. It's a tough question. Yeah, things in geotech always seem to be answered with it depends. <laughs> if anyone gives you a straight answer, you well, <laughs> questionable at best. Um, so another question rolled in. Um, in terms of lateral displacements could sometimes occur after seismic shaking, um, for example, the lower, lower San Fernando Dam. Uh, Area's intensity tends to be maxed out as soon as or immediately after the shaking is stopped, while the majority of deformation may occur after um, an earthquake. And mm. do you, okay, so let me just read the last part of this question. Um, do you still find it's a good match between the normalized plots between various intensity and ground deformation um, cannot be expected um, as in the Linehan Dam? Uh, if so, yeah. do you think your conclusions are limited to dams that do not undergo significant liquefaction? Yeah, good question. Um, okay, so a, a few things. So in the case of uh, Anderson Dam, based on the um, the seismic evaluation of the dam from the owner's standpoint and, and so forth, um, a, a critical aspect of that particular work uh, was what is the what was the residual strength and what were the post earthquake type of deformations? The the expectation it was very close to an active fault. Uh, the ex, it was the expected that the the alluvium uh, the lower finer the the filled material that I had highlighted was going to liquefy, um, and so that aspect was not included in my analysis. So the focus of what I've looked at is just inertial driven loading. So that is a missing part. Um, now I, I would say you know there's there were probably two critical aspects in terms of that part. First is the generation of excess pore pressures. And then second uh, would be the, the gravity driven part. So I guess in the first part is that area's intensity has been shown by others to relate well to uh, liquefaction.